Okay. Uh, we'll go ahead and call to order the curriculum instruction committee meeting at six o'clock. Item number one is summer school report, and I'll turn it over to Jake and Josh. Thanks, Kyle. Pretty quick. Turn it over to Josh to explain some of our summer school numbers. Big thanks to all the work that Josh did. I'm sorry, but I can't. I can't. There's all this back. I can't hear. Yeah, we're getting some a lot of feedback from the monitors. All right, how are we now? You hear me, Kate? Better, yeah. thank you. Let's see if we got it. So um, again, just a, a ton of thanks to Josh. The last two summers have been uh, anything but regular, but very important for our kids to be able to extend their education through the, the summer. So he's here to share the numbers with us tonight. Yeah, thank you very much, Jake. Um, real quickly, uh, we have two documents that I shared with the board tonight. Um, the first one is just a summary of the last 10 years. Um, our FTEs um, actually uh, just point out, uh, you, know, you can see pre-COVID uh, 2019, and then our, our last year when we, prior year when we went all virtual, we certainly had a dip, but we did, did pull off some summer school um, numbers in 2020. Last, this past summer, we're real happy to report, our students turned out um, and our families turned out for summer school recognize the importance of, of continuing education in a very difficult year. Um, so we're happy to see those numbers jump. Our FTEs actually went up to a pre-COVID time period a little bit uh, before 2018. So um, students and families really turned out well for summer school. Um, just on page two of the document I shared, uh, just wanna go through and highlight a couple of quick pieces. Our high school online classes, that's been a growing program, but I think it took a little bit of a dip this year, and I could attribute that probably to a little bit of, of online fatigue and COVID fatigue, um, different type of class structure. Um, and, and that took a little bit of a downturn this past year. We expect that to bounce back next year. Um, our middle school programming continues to rise even in the COVID year. And uh, very successful. That continues to travel. It continues to travel as we go from uh, with our middle school program. It, it's syncs with our high school program, whether it's at North or South each year. So uh, the last piece, uh, big program that we had was our elementary remedial studies. Uh, we had almost 700 students participate. That's about on par with past years. Um, and uh, that operates at five sites throughout the district. Uh, the last piece I wanna throw out, uh, Lori Rolsey, who has been a huge supporter with that program for, I don't know, countless years. This will be our last year supporting summer school. She's been our sort of our, our guiding light, if so to speak, for our elementary uh, reading and math program. So she's starting to wind down in her career and this is her last year. So I really appreciate working with her. Um, high school, uh, we spent a lot of time in the, uh, in the spring talking about what that might look like for remedial studies for our high school programming. We had a, a, a bumper crop of students participate there. 184 students participated as compared to 62 last year, in our really deep COVID year. So a lot of kids got involved. Um, Again, we talked a bit about transportation back then, and we transported kids from north to south, um, as well as our middle school program from Horace Mann to south. So we did work transportation really well, and kids were successful. We had a lot of students earn credit over the summer. Um, also at Central High, we had a remedial program. They bumped up significantly from last year as well, um, and they're getting going with that program and doing a couple of different tweaks to make it more accessible to kids throughout each week. Um, staff feedback, a little points there. We do a survey at the end. And, and largely, we are staffed with a, a very similar staff each year. Our staff for summer school continues to come back year in and year out. We struggled a little bit this year with, I think, again, that COVID fatigue. People needed a little bit of a break, but we were able to be fully staffed, and we're looking forward to some folks coming back next year, uh, back into the fall. So, any questions? Questions for Josh? Josh, thank you. Thanks for a, a great, great program this year, and I'm glad to see the, the numbers are bouncing back up. Uh, with that, we'll move on to item number two, which is the 2021-2023 Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse AODA Grant Project, and then it'll be Jake, Jason, and uh, Giselle. Yeah, I'm going to step off and turn it over to Jason and Giselle. All right, 
Well, thank you very much for uh, having Giselle and I here today. I um, just want to introduce Giselle Simon. She's a school counselor at South High School and also our, our um, district AOD, AOD coordinator. Um, so she's a, it's in her second year of the district and she's done an outstanding job with our AODA program within the district. Um, just want to take a little time today to um, talk through our AODA grant that we've been awarded by um, DPI. So I want to take some opportunity to explain a little bit about the grant in the process that we went through and filling the application out. And then Giselle is going to speak um, on the programs that we're going to be implementing at the middle school and high school program to support students in AODA. So the AODA um, grant through DPI, it's a very competitive grant. Um, we've been very fortunate over the last three cycles that we've been awarded this grant. Um, it's a $25,000 grant. Um, and that application process is a very competitive process. There are 48 districts um, uh, throughout the state of Wisconsin that were awarded this grant to a little, a little over $900,000 or $700 million. And we're one of the uh, 48 districts out of 81 applicants. So we're very proud. It's a very competitive grant and has become more competitive over the years. Um, this grant is $25,000 annually over a two year period of time. So that process that we went through, I just want to briefly talk on that and how we came about um, the application, how we um, constructed our application. We really, um, from the starting point, we really were using our data, um, most recent data as much as possible to drive um, the direction of the grant. So as you can see in that, I believe it's the third slide, we really utilized our YRBS, our youth risk behavioral um, data from 2017 and 19 and looked at the trends uh, from that, um, maybe some growth, but also some areas, um, maybe of improvement, and really targeted that along with um, our referral data, um, students with possession of um, alcohol and other drugs within the school settings at our middle school and high school. I gave some examples on the slides of some of the data that we, what we um, that drove uh, our grant a little bit in the direction of our grant. We really saw that there was an increase in, at the middle school level of students uh, vaping um, over the past 30 days. It was a, during that window of time, high school students, um, their use of alcohol had increased um, since the years of 2015, 17, and into 19. Um, so we, we have seen that use of alcohol and other drugs um, increase probably in particular our middle school students with that tobacco use and vaping. Um, from that information, then we, we created, um, Giselle and her team, um, had some, some really good discussions, thorough discussions, and really asked the why. Why is the data where it's at? And um, so we kind of created that root cause analysis. So we really believe, and that team believed that uh, two of the reasons of, of maybe where our, our data is where it's at and where the students' use is, is one is um, just the violation of the tobacco use policies are not cons consistently offered or helped so that that education, counseling, and referral to cessation um, just is not there at our middle school. They feel it's there at this point in time. So really look, it's probably more of a punitive type uh, situation that we see. And then the other portion is, portion is just that peer um, education, that opportunities for, uh, for student support um, when it comes to AODA, um, student mentoring, and just maybe adult mentoring through the AODA um, process and issues. So those were the areas that really drove um, um, the purpose of our grant and the why behind the application for our grant. And then um, that really went into then our practice priority or really our action planning. And we really, um, Giselle and her team really are looking at two areas that they're really driving towards for the next two years um, on making a difference in action planning. And I'm gonna let Giselle talk about kind of the meat of the grant and that's our action planning behind it. Uh, good evening. So after we looked at, we had to do a, an analysis of where we were and what services we were providing for our students. And after we um, completed that analysis, we found two major areas of deficit. One of them was our lack of follow through when a student commits a policy violation regarding AODA issues. Um, we have some punitive measures with our policy, but we do not have a consistent systematic way of addressing the issue after the fact. What can we offer the students and the parents um, to deal with the situation if it's just, you know, depending on the where they land on the spectrum of addiction. So one of our action steps is to train our counselors in expert. So to do a brief um, a, a screening, see if the student is in need of a brief intervention or a referment 
of referring to treatment. Um, so that's the one thing we're going to do. We were lucky enough to be, we applied to, through WISH to be able to uh, receive the training through the Department of Public Instruction, and that will be taking place next month. In addition to that, we were, our analysis showed that we needed to have more preventative uh, measures, and what we chose to do was to establish two um, student-led peer groups. One of them is going to be at the middle school. In the middle school, we're implementing fact, fact that uh, movement.org, and that's um, its focus is more on, on anti-tobacco. So we have paired up with the um, the two agencies that we're paired up with is the American Lung Association that's providing a small grant to support that, as well as the Lakeshore Tobacco Prevention Network. Um, so that's going to be in the middle school. It's about uh, you know your leadership, uh, culture of school that's more positive. Um, you know, implementing measures that show that, you know, it's uh, negative behavior, et cetera. Because uh, we have seen an increase in, in the use of tobacco in our middle schools, um, especially in vaping. At the high school, we're going to implement the, for, um, the peers for peers through a partnership with Elevate. And that's going to be more about alcohol and other drugs. Um, it has several objectives. Um, it is, uh, we, it is uh, meant to increase high school uh, the perception of um, AODA issues as more risky. Um, it's a, we want to increase um, in the peer perception of disapproval of use. Uh, we also want to provide tools for parents to increase their communication with students about how they feel about AODA and give them the tools that they need to be able to open up those communications. All right, our last item uh, tonight for C9 is the class size report. I'll hand it over to Jake. Yeah, so class size report this year, um, as you know, one of the one of the things we do with the funds from uh, the COVID dollars was to keep our class sizes small this year in, in hopes of uh, being able to use that transition back for students. So uh, as you look at the historical numbers here, pretty friendly. Classes are ever small enough, uh, but pretty good numbers here. So I'll just walk you through very quickly, and then if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. So uh, as we look at that first chart, that's on page, uh, yeah, the second page, that's probably the most informational piece for our elementary schools and what that shows is just the class size and the number of classes at each grade level for each where those schools come in. Keep in mind their Friday report we'll have for you at the next board meeting. So this is kind of preemptive to that. Uh, but these were these were the numbers as of uh, last week and everything moves a little bit but pretty nice for class sizes. So those things highlighted in red are the, the class sizes where we're at or over policy. Uh, and as you can see, not much of that happening in the district compared to what we've seen in the past. And just remember, we kind of staff our elementary schools at about a 22 to one ratio and then principals have some uh, flexibility in how they want to staff each class. So if they have a high needs class, additional staff there. So what you'll see sometimes is you'll see a school that goes over class size. And if you look at those numbers, you can see that they could go under if they wanted to. Uh, but there's a reason for why they, they do what they do. Like grants the perfect example of that between the 17 and 16.
that's the thing to keep in mind there. Our high schools look pretty good. Um, we try not to have classes under 20. We try not to have classes over 30. Um, you see it happens a little bit uh, at North just because all the classes that they offer are scheduled to drop at the same time. So it's very easy to offer a cap class here, a Chinese class there, et cetera. Uh, even those classes are pretty close to 20 most of the time. And I have 42. That fell into that category sometime with FlexMod. Uh, we just kind of removed them from this report when they when they went to FlexMod, and you can see kind of how they could uh, be up there in so the number of sections they have with their large medium and small medium uh, flexes, and then uh, discussion. And then, uh, really, I think the next piece of information that you probably probably find interesting is. Uh, the number of sections over 30. So that gets pretty tight, uh, especially at our middle schools. So we had three of those at Farnsworth, uh, and 14 at Horace Lane. You can kind of see where that happens and how that happens. Uh, all of those pretty close to that 30. Uh, social studies will always creep up a little bit. And then if you were in which program, uh, had some inflated numbers as well. But Otherwise, pretty good this year, especially when we look at it in terms of historical content. Uh, suburban was 15 in North, I think, was uh, 96 in the images. If you look, the numbers that they spread them across, they can even out, but uh, sometimes we'll have classes under 20 and over 30 in the same class just because of the schedule of concepts. In period period. Overall, my summary here would be uh, the money is well spent in terms of our call center positions. I think as we hear about the struggles kids have to integrate into the classroom, it's serious. Any questions for Jake in the chat? Okay. So if I'm reading this correctly that there are 96 classes at North that are over 30. Um, I know you said something, but I had a hard time deciphering it. All this feedback is good. Uh, why are you, I'm, I'm assuming there are some smaller AP courses or other things that, that factor into that, but I'm looking at a lot of these are like geometry, you know, I mean, if you're not getting geometry and you're in a class over 30, how much person is going to help you understand geometry? You know, I mean, I, I understand the value of an AP course, but I also understand the value of, of our kids who aren't on the AP track understanding geometry. So at what point do we balance that out? I mean, 96 classes over. Yeah, 96 is uh, low historically, but. I, I understand what you say. That, you know, the, the hard part then is we would go up to that list of under 20 and we'd say, what classes do we want to cut? Um, so I think that's the, that's always the challenge there. It's either add staff or cut courses. Uh, it, it sometimes you'll we'll see that class that is listed the same on, on each one, right? You'll have a class. I don't be happy with so looking at like English one, English three, but you'll have somewhere the exact same class will be under 20 for some sections and over 30 for others. English one is an example, English three is an example. It just is trying to schedule kids in a way that allows them to take classes that they need to. So a lot of that becomes I want to take this AP class, I want to be in band, I want to be in classes that aren't offered a lot during the day. Uh, and these teachers allow for that to happen. I, I know Eric and Jim and Kelly can speak to, to their departments, but a lot of times that's taken back to the department too, and it's discussed with it. I know Matt has discussions within the department about what class sizes should be like and where they feel comfortable with it, where they want more class sizes. So uh, we do try to involve our students in discussions as well, which is without more staff, our hands are tied. It's either cutting classes or The other thing that's, that stuck out to me is Wilson Elementary, their fourth and fifth grade are all big for a reason. 
Yeah, Wilson had a bubble go through, uh, and their numbers got high, and they elected not to a school choice issue uh, in their district, and a lot of the kids did. Um, they don't or staff appropriately on the 22 to 1 ratio. So if they have a bubble at that grade level, so you could possibly do a split class and distribute those 15 at first grade differently, but that's just how Kyle tells me. Uh, made sense to do when they had some kids come in at the end, but again, we could add staff. We could place to add them. Uh, I'm just looking at thinking this is our two classes two years in a row going to middle school. It's this is a hard one for me to present because I've never argued that we should have smaller smaller classes would be great. So say otherwise and uh, disrespect from the teacher it's to, to say otherwise it's just uh, how these people are set up to resources. So. Is, is where we are, uh, and they they knowingly took those kids out. Like Kyle at that time, was to knowingly took those numbers. They were comfortable writing those numbers up to at least increase the number of teachers in their building. Any other questions, sir? Okay. Do you have any more for Jake? No, thank you. Any other questions for Jake? Hey, none. See you guys again. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I now call the facilities, recreation, and theater committee to meeting to order. And with the huge agenda that we've got, we've got Mr. Albright giving us an update on facility projects. Mr. Albright. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> okay. Um, so our, first of all, I want to say thanks for having me back here. And uh, I'm proud to say that our department ran real strong when I wasn't here. The summer projects were started by me uh, like a year ago in December, but Joe Walmer ran through them and got them going. So it's a team effort and part of that. Uh, North High ADA bathroom. Uh, when we did the Here and Now program and we Display some of the special ed, some other rooms, it came apparent that they didn't have enough ADA bathrooms. Um, so this summer we were able to complete this. This is in the ground floor at North High. Um, and we have access two ways. Uh, the first slide shows it from the corridor where the lockers are. And then the next slide, you see the inside, and there's also access from the rooms. Um, it's what the teachers wanted so they could take kids from outside the classroom areas so to the hallway and get to the bathroom or they could use it from the classrooms and there's you can see large changing room and area for all kinds of work in there and uh, it's really helpful we had a lot of students when, when we uh, when we run program closed uh third slide uh north field house you guys i believe were aware we did the uh, naming rights you can see what uh, what came about that uh you can see south's new logo on, on the main court there um Again, uh, Terry contacted me probably in November or so last year about this. I said timing is right because we were scheduled to sand the floor and then hand it off to Joe because I wasn't there to see it complete, but they went through all the changes. Um, it turned out really nice. The next slide shows another uh, change. We work with the school. They want to change some paint colors. It was a kind of a Goofy mustard color down below, and then we had a different yellow down below. And North will pay for some of the other uh, blue and yellow, and, uh, light blue, their new colors they got going. Just to brighten it up and modernize it some a little bit. And again, working with the school with the colors, uh, I think it turned out real nice. It's really, it's really pretty. So both South was done the year before, North has done this past summer. So they're all redone in about 15, 16 years. So. Um, you guys are aware that we added the decks and I called it a, a, a walkway instead of a trail. 
Uh, this leads to the um, sidewalk over by Taylor Drive. This connects right by their blacktop at the Jackson School. Um, it has worked out well for getting the kids out of the school. Um, so you have to recall these pictures are probably from a week and a half ago before uh, Union Avenue was open. That oh, I got some great things, but again, you can see how the board and district work well with the city with easements that you guys granted. So uh, this is at the corner of Georgia Avenue and Union Avenue looking east. Uh, you can see the fence line was always there um, that uh, we never imposed as far as we could. Granted, there's a ditch there. The ditch is all gone. It's all curb and gutter, which I'm sure you guys all saw now. They're a little late or a little old already because you can drive on it. But a week and a half, I thought this was a great picture. Uh, <laughs> again, this is at the, the driveway. Yeah, of course, man's driveway looking east, uh, showing the new sidewalk that was put in along Union Avenue. One of the things that as I came back in June, I said, well, we got the new sidewalk, but there's no way to get the kids up to the, the school. So we got that sidewalk down, which is in the next slide. This is in the driveway looking north towards the school. You can see the new sidewalk on your right. Uh, the next slide is back up to the school looking down and to your left, you see how the sidewalk kind of curves around. Look at it today, it's all graded in, looks like it's been there forever. It, it turned out nice. Um, so there's some of the projects we've done for the summer. The Horace Mann building, um, steel is scheduled to be shipped this week, Thursday. We've been waiting on it since April. So this is across the parking lot over here, just north of the old tennis courts. Um, and they've been waiting for the floor slab, but steel's coming in and they'll get working on it. What you see here is looking west and of course there's the detention pond right there, which is part of, part of life these days. Uh, this is looking up on the slab, those uh, orange pipes you see there in Camille, those will all be floor drains for all the snow trucks and things that drip off of it. Um, to the left, there's a bathroom, which we had to have, and to the left there is a paint mixing room. So the rec department will be able to bring their paint mixing on the Taylor Drive and do all the paint mixing right here at Horace Mann in a real nice building. Uh, in addition, we'll be able to mix paint there as well. So it's a combination and work together for both departments. Uh, rec department is sharing part of this building for their storage needs. Um, it's really a team effort, so working well together. The salt shed is complete. Uh, which is right next to this building. Um, we're just waiting for more concrete cures and uh, to load up with salt. Uh, there's some gates going on there to close it off a little bit more. The far right, the larger bunker is salt. The middle one is uh, will be a salt sand mixture and the far to the left is straight sand. And off to our project that's currently in place. Um, this is the sidewalk which was poured yesterday. This is to the rec department entrance at the Administration Services Building. Um, there was a bunch of dead ash trees out there. Our crews took all the ash trees out. Uh, we've got a good group of guys. We still have some more to east, but we took the ones near the building, which were kind of an eyesore. We'll keep working on the rest. Um, we're reshuffling some offices in place with some office position, uh, office areas. This is up in business services uh, with, with material that was there. One challenge we did have, <clears throat> this is a, <clears throat> excuse me, this is across, <clears throat> this is across in the boardroom area. And then looking into the human resources area, which was um, office partitions. And the concern was there was some confidential material that could be heard over the walls. Uh, so we took them down and we put up drywall, we're putting up drywall walls in that area. Um, and we were able to secure it too, so no one can walk out of the, the boardroom area and then walk right into the human resources. Uh, wasn't something we planned to do, but it just made the most sense to do our staff was doing that work. Um, today, it's all drywall already. The guys are drywall taping it and stuff now. Upstairs too, this will be the transportation office. Again, the same way, there weren't enough office petitions and uh, this will be adjoining to a training center area. So we need a little bit more privacy to talk about children on the buses. And one of the things that was new a week and a half ago was that the fiber was at the building. They had a schedule and since that time, fiber is connected and there's internet at the building. Uh, electronics, Wayne staff was able to make some old wireless stuff we had taken down the schools because the new ones ordered for the building. 
not their uh, delays with supply chain. With that, I can take any questions. We're about to Dave um, and um, and Katie. Have any questions at all? Well, thank you so much for giving us an update and welcome back. Thank you. And with that, we stand adjourned. Well, okay. Well, that seems to be a bit better. Oh. Okay. So we're trying to play with the Yeah, and with me, you're going to have to pot that mic way down simply because I am a human kicker box. <laughs>
So like, yeah. Okay. Hi, Sue. I'm doing all right. How about you? Hi, Mark. Oh, that was, yeah. You can't win if you do that. No. <laughs> no. Hello, Mr. Lasser. So here, Mr. Voice from God, Voice of God, we had trouble hearing you. You were a little muffled. Um, do you want us to keep our mics on, and then you'll you'll pot us up and you'll mute us from here from there? Or okay. Thank you, Voice of God. Oh, test. It works. We all set? We all set? Set be ready. Okay. Uh, we'll go ahead and call to order the Committee of the Whole at 6.41 p.m. Uh, I'm seeking a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. And second. Moved and, moved and second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Roll call finds us all present with the exception of Marsha Reinfeller, who is excused. Uh, item number four is the introduction of William Tompkins, the South High School Associate Principal. And I'll turn this over to Seth. So happy to have uh, William with us tonight. William, if you'd like to come to the, the podium, please. Uh, we're here uh, tonight to have the board uh, be introduced to William Tompkins, our new Associate Principal at South High School. 
We're glad that William is joining us in the Sheboygan Area School District, uh, coming to us from Kenosha, where he served uh, in his last role as a Dean of Students. Um, so we're glad that Will's here. So thank you, Will. I'd like to give a little background about yourself and talk uh, to the board. Yes, I'm very excited to be here. Um, I think about myself. Uh, I've been working with kids ever since I was 18 years old. At daycares, after school programs, camps. Also, I uh, started uh, teaching as a substitute teacher at Racine Unified. I taught there for a few years, uh, then moved to Milwaukee. And then after that, I moved to Kenosha. I spent all my years as a special education teacher. Uh, for most of my years, except for the last seven years, where I was a uh, dean of students. And uh, just to let you know a little bit more about myself, I do believe that you know, all kids can learn and you know, kids deserve uh, chances. I also, uh, you know, like working with others and uh, feel that uh, this new leadership role is going to help me uh, reach more students and help more kids and also uh, help the staff also. Uh, just kind of learning about the support and the, the, uh, the uh, culture, uh, South High. Uh, can't wait to learn a little bit more about the city and more about other schools and what's going on in this district. The, uh, the asset to this district. And, um, pretty much that's it. Thank you all. Very happy that you've joined us in the SoFi team. It's a great day to be a Red Wing. <laughs> Thanks, Wayne. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to item number five. Um, so tonight we do have some community input scheduled. Um, community input is typically not posted at a committee of the whole, but we've got a hot button topic on the agenda tonight. So we want to include opportunity for community input. Now no community input tonight is specifically pertaining to district metrics when facial coverings will be required at the building level when COVID cases are at a high level. So if you have anything that's not pertaining to essentially the COVID mitigation measures recommended by the administration at the last meeting regarding building positivity rates and facial coverings, that would need to be saved for the next meeting at public comment where there is not a specific cited topic, okay? Uh, before we begin, I'm gonna read the public input guidelines and then those who would like to address the board may um, come to one of the podiums. Welcome to this meeting of the Sheboygan Area School District Board of Education. We are pleased that you're interested in educational issues. We are interested in your comments and concerns about the school district. In order for the meeting to flow smoothly, we would appreciate that the following guidelines be followed by anyone wishing to address the Board of Education this evening. One, please limit comments or suggestions to three minutes or less because we do have a full agenda to follow. Comments and suggestions on the school district are welcome. Personal criticism and or derogatory remarks directed at members of the Board of Education or employees of the school district are out of order. If you wish to provide input and would like to be recognized, please raise your hand or step forward to the podium. After being recognized, please stand and clearly state and spell your name and address for the record. Also for the record, please sign your name and address on the clipboard after you have spoken. The board normally receives citizen input and does not respond or debate. If there is a need for an answer or response to a concern or issue, the superintendent or one of the administrative staff members will get back to you within the week. Thank you for your assistance. So with that, those who would like to address the board, please um, approach one of the podiums. Hello. Hi there. Please Hi. Uh, state your name and address. Yes, my name is Faith. Dan Brola. An address? Uh, 1214 South 11th Street. Okay, you have three minutes. Pardon? You have three minutes. Okay, um, a word about masks. Um, I've got some skin in this game. Uh, two children in my family spent 14 years in the Sheboygan Area School District. Uh, this year, I uh, witnessed uh, two of those uh, same kids um, be forced into isolation. Uh, one of them did end up getting COVID. And I'm just wondering, um, as a whole here, 
Um, how do you feel about the fact that 700,000 people in our country lost their lives? Okay. Um, masks? Why didn't that help anything? That's my question. Do all of you? Anybody here? Agree with that? Thank you. Speak up. This is not mine. You better agree with that. Point of order. One person's allowed to speak at a time. Thank you. Okay. All right, so regarding masking, whose, whose kids are there? I understand right now it's an option. Is that correct? Reach a certain metric, then they have to be worn. Is that correct? That's not currently in place. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering, I, can, I know I can't ask you questions directly. Um, um, I understand that there's no medical professionals or doctors um, in front of me. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, the people that come here um, are the parents and that the school board, its directors, and all of its committees are not parents of the Sheboygan County children. We are. We've got every right to decide what is safest for our children. Um, so going forward, um, how do I know that um, if masking was required that the other person's mask is working? Each individual has their own level of immunity, their own level of health. They may be unhealthy for, for people, underlying conditions. Nobody knows. Masking has proven not to be effective. I would ask uh, next time, maybe you could have uh, some science teachers come forward and explain that reasoning. I, I understand that the guidance here is given through the CDC. And I've been digging, doing some very, very uh, deep digging on all of this, uh, as far as masking goes. Um, now, can I talk about something other than masking? Just, just or do I have positive. to wait until the subject comes up? This is my first time. Tonight's just on district positivity and masking in relation to it. And your three minutes expired. Did you say ventilation? No, and your three minutes have expired. Your, your three minutes is up, ma'am. Oh, okay. Yeah. All righty. Thank you. Please state your name and address for the record. John Paul, 5332 Wild Meadow Drive. Okay. Do you have three minutes? Uh, so last week, uh, I was accused by a member of the board of not understanding math. Um, so again, my problem with the proposed uh, policy is the numbers are too low and the testing days are a little out of whack. 2% means two people out of every 100. 4% means four people out of every, every 100. And this is my fifth attending the school board district meetings. So I am learning as I go along, but that's simple math. I don't have to be told otherwise. The days of testing, if I'm uncorrect, it can be corrected at some point tonight, but you could have a positivity rate of a 2% on day one, masks go into effect. Day two, the positivity rate drops below 2%. However, you have to wait 14 days to be able to take masks off your kids. 14th day, jumps back up to 2%, you go to another 14 days worth of masking. That means you could have 28 days worth of masking with two days in the positivity rate. To me, some of that revolves around personal choice. We had a member of this board attend a Bucks game this year. They stated that they didn't wear a mask because the CDC guidelines, all fine and dandy. But the guidelines at the Pfizer form were required to wear a mask unless you were eating or drinking. Social media photos show that that person did not follow those guidelines. I don't know if it was done via personal choice or not, but it shows you that the people on this board, some of them, one in particular, decided to make a choice for himself and that he didn't have to wear a mask. So that is what the rest of the parents of this board 
or this school district need to follow. If they pass this tonight and you feel that it's in your personal safety of it, do what the person on this board did at the Pfizer forum. Make a medical decision apparently for yourself. Don't follow the guidelines that are in the building apparently. That's the problem that I have and that is part of the American Marxist movement that Mark Levin has so talked about very well. I would like to donate a, order. a copy of it. That is not you can call out of order that if you want, but this is my order, First sir, Amendment and I continue. continue I will observe my 27 seconds. I'm order, going to leave this book and any board member that would like you to use it order, very sir. well can. This is not pertaining Thank to the decided topic. Thank you very much topic. for your time. This is and it does pertain to it. Topic. It's medical choice for it. Thank you. The audience will maintain order. Sir, please state your name for the record. Bill Moss, 1329 North 47th Street, Chewagon 53081. Thank you. You have three minutes. Experts claim everyone must wear masks to keep schools open. We'll look at the evidence. Remember school on October 12th of last year? I do. Six foot distancing, two days a week in person, two days virtual, Wednesday, no class, no locker use, no bubbler use. Bring your own water bottle, eat at your desk, no football, and yes, mandatory mask, even outside. Two days later, it was announced that all learning would switch to virtual on Monday, October 19th for two weeks. Ultimately, that two weeks became nearly three months as we finally returned to the hybrid model on January 11th. How about October 12th this year? Desks pushed together, five-day in-person learning, lockers and bubblers available, eating with friends in the cafeteria, football and other activities flourishing, students interacting normally while having fun, an optional mask allowing contagious smiles to be shared by old and new friends alike. Compare our experience last year to this one. Despite vastly more stringent measures, including greatly reduced in-person class sizes and minimal student interaction, the mandatory policy failed to prevent the increase in cases and all in-person learning was lost for nearly three months. How about this year? The optional policy succeeded in summer school so much so that when you voted unanimously on July 27th to allow optional this school year, but four weeks later, two board members felt that further masking discussion was needed. They got their wish. Further discussion resulted in a marathon meeting a week later and has continued on a bi-weekly basis ever since. Meanwhile, for the first six weeks of school this fall, optional masking has continued to keep our schools open with larger class sizes, despite the scary, more highly infectious Delta variant. Sorry, experts, the evidence clearly reveals that optional masking has easily outperformed mandatory in our schools. Not only does mandatory fail to keep schools open, it flunks at improving communication and learning. How many times have you struggled to hear a mass speaker? How do you think teachers and students, especially young ones, feel? If masking improved our ability to communicate, we would have been wearing masks for centuries in all sorts of environments. Classrooms, boardrooms, doctor's offices, courtrooms, press conferences, sidelines, and even Zoom meetings, to name a few. Why replace a successful policy with a previously failed one that creates an inferior learning environment? Doing so is anti-science. Examine the evidence, analyze the data, and think clearly. If you do that, the choice is obvious. The report card shows optional masking with an A, while mandatory gets an F. Keep optional masking. Do it for the kids. No further discussion is required. Thank you. Thank you. Please state your name for the record and address. Geraldine Liana, 522 Grant Avenue. You have three minutes. Um, I have one comment to make. There was a 14-year-old um, student who died of COVID in the Fort Atkinson School District. Died. I'm just wondering uh, which of these parents would, would like to sacrifice their child um, because they don't want to wear a mask. When there is... Folks, obvious please. proof that masks um, control COVID. That's my only comment.
Hello. Hi. My name is Stephanie O'Connell. I live at 704 Highland Terrace in Sheboygan, 53083. You have three minutes. Thank you. Um, I, as well as many other people in this city and in this country, realize that it is past time to begin living a life with COVID instead of trying to battle this invisible enemy. We have a vaccine. And if that does not bring about an end to these mitigation strategies, then this tyranny will never stop. It will continue to bleed us of our freedoms and our children may never know a world without people coercing them into taking EUA vaccines against their will. They may never know a world where they can go to is school without being Is this pertaining to facial political? coverings in the district and positivity rates? I'm sorry? This is about facial coverings and positivity rates in the building, not vaccines. Thank you. I understand that. That'll be coming next month once they, once they authorize it for five to 11 year olds. Thank you, Kyle. Let me uh, leave up, leave, get back to where I left off. They may never know a world where they can go to school without being political pawns used to leverage control over the good people of this country. You, as a school board, have no right to make medical decisions for my family or anyone else's family other than your own. You are not doctors. You are not medical professionals. You are tool used to implement and to divide and destroy our country. This is a war and no shots are being fired. It is an information war. We are told we cannot think for ourselves, that we cannot research for ourselves. Our country is falling apart from the inside and that is because that's the only way that it can happen. Nobody can take us down like we can take ourselves down. We're doing a great job of it. Now, remember, this comes down to individual rights granted to us by the Constitution of the United States of America, and you cannot change them. You cannot brush them aside. You cannot rule by executive order and edict, but you can tear this country apart. And how safe will we be then? Anyone else who cares to address the board this evening? Good evening, Bill Jones, 3431 North 10th Street. You have three minutes. Yesterday, 16-year-old Grace Smith of Laramie, Wyoming, tried to attend school while not wearing a mask. The school was put on lockdown and she was handcuffed and taken to jail. Los Angeles metro area will lose 3,000 firefighters. 40% of flight delayed canceled today were Southwest airline flights. The mainstream media won't tell you, but this was not weather related. This is a work slowdown by flight crews and air traffic controllers. Most of these pilots are veterans. They took an oath to the constitution and are honoring that oath. The things in common with these incidents are people fighting for their freedoms. I'm gonna no longer pretend this about masks and injections because it's not. Some here will laugh, but this is about protecting our constitution and our republic. If you wanna give up your freedom for safety, that's your prerogative. However, you will not take away mine. Dr. Fauci and the CDC do not control me. They are going outside their lane when they inject the equity discussions into science. They are all about money. What about the botch testing in the beginning? What about the J&J &J pause? What about the fact that no study has been done for the use of ivermectin? What about the fact that there's no discussion of natural immunity or herd immunity? What about the dissent in the FDA's own panel fighting amongst itself? Why have there not been a study of the use of masks in school age population? Why are we months into a, in on a study of the injection into children and they're gonna to try to force it on them almost immediately? What about the adverse reactions to the injections? 
This is a movement of we the people. It's larger than you may think. I'm sure the extra money is good, but do you want to make this blood money? There is a chance that the debt ceiling will not be raised and the money won't be there anyway. So where do will you stand? Will you continue these draconian measures? Is this a hill to die on? I mean that you for uh, metaphorically, no need for the FBI on that one. We will not back down. I would encourage students to homeschool school if all this, all this goes on. Balls in your court, tread lightly. Thank you. Good luck. Others who would care to address the board this evening? Hi guys, um, this is name and address. Oh, sorry, uh, Tracy Alley, forty six twenty seven West Randy King Drive, yeah, uh, Wagon five three zero eight three. You have three minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, I just was wanted to bring up um, at least one thing regarding your mitigation uh, recommendation that you have on the table right now. And before you make a decision about that, I would like you to first think about, I don't know if you're aware of these TikTok challenges that these kids have been doing. It's hitting us hard apparently. And um, there are no soap dispensers in some of these bathrooms here. Um, apparently at the high schools also, and across the board at all the middle schools. And my son had told me about this and I asked him, well, how do you wash your hands? Just with water. Really? Um, yeah. So we're trying to be at school safely, right? Because we all want to be here. We want what's best for everybody. But if my child doesn't have soap to properly wash his hands, that's part of a mitigation strategy, right? to keep from spreading germs to everybody else. If he can't properly wash his hands after lunch, what good is that gonna do anybody? And then we're gonna sit and wonder why everyone gets sick. And it's not just COVID sick, there's regular sick. Regular sick still happens, okay? So let's take a step back. And first, before you make a decision on masking again, raise the percentage to 30% per classroom is what I say, not per building. And make sure these schools have soap, okay? Before you make a rash decision about masking again, that's just gonna continue on for the rest of their lives. When do we say enough is enough, guys? Please. Honestly, can we rationally think about this? These kids are tearing out soap dispensers in their schools because of a stupid challenge in the middle of a pandemic, okay? Let's make sure we get soap dispensers before we make a decision on masking again so we can make sure these kids are safe. And he asked the ass ass assistant, assistant principal here, and he said, are we gonna get more soap? He says, probably not, because let will just rip them off the wall again. Okay. I think we need to do something about this. I think we should address this, right? Before, you know, we sit and try to mask them up again. We need to make sure they have soap and not just sanitizer because some kids can't handle that chemical on their skin. So please keep masks optional until we figure out the soap situation. Thank you. Anyone else who would care to address the board this evening? Uh, Maeve Quinn, the address is 310 St. Clair Avenue. You have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Finalizing the details of the COVID-19 response plan is critical in keeping our students, teachers, and staff safe during this pandemic. During this pandemic, our superintendent, 
and executive management team needs to be able to pivot quickly to enact mitigation strategies as needed at each individual school when there was a quick spread of COVID within the building. It is my hope tonight that all of you have a really good discussion and that you vote to support the mitigation strategy regarding requiring face masks that was shared at the board meeting a couple of weeks ago. At your last meeting, the majority of you raised your hands in support of this updated COVID-19 response plan. Our students, teachers, and staff need to have in-person instruction this year. And in order to ensure that it safely happens, our superintendent must be able to employ mitigation strategies to support in-person instruction. At the last meeting, the superintendent shared that he and the EMT studied the data from the fall of 2019 to determine the appropriate thresholds for positive cases at each school grade level. The differences of the percentages are due to the fact that there is no vaccine available for students at the 4K through sixth grade level. Hence, the recommendation is for a threshold of 2% for 4K through sixth grade. The recommendation of 4% threshold for seventh grade through 12th grade is due to the availability of the vaccine for students ages 12 years old and older. It is now October. And tragically, our positive COVID-19 cases continue to rise in our community and in our schools. Today, it was even reported that the transmission positivity was 11%, and our COVID numbers jumped by 100 people. It was also shared that 10 people, including two people in their 40s, have recently died from this contagious virus. Our school district deserves a COVID-19 response plan that provides the superintendent and EMT with a variety of mitigation strategies to allow our district to continue in-person instruction and keep our students, teachers, and staff safe during an uptick in cases of COVID-19. As a former Sheboygan Area School District Board member, I urge you to support the updated COVID plan presented two weeks ago by the superintendent. Thank you. Anyone else would care to address the board this evening? Ruth Villarreal, 1406 Pennsylvania Avenue. You have three minutes. I feel like a broken record. I don't know how else to get through to you guys, but I just witnessed tonight a very clear psych issue. And this woman dipped out of here because she's afraid she's going to die. Okay. I have a stepson who was in public school last year. I kept that one home and I educated him at home. There is a clear difference between the two children. I have one at home constantly washing his hands because he's afraid he's gonna die. Okay, that's what public school did to him. Now you wanna talk about statistics and I don't know how you guys are getting your information, but pediatric deaths, this is off the CDC website. Oh, hail the CDC website. Pediatric deaths by state with COVID and from all causes, January 1st, 2020 to October 2nd, 2021. Dated October 6, 2021. In the state of Wisconsin, we have three total deaths from that time frame in children from zero to 17. What it doesn't tell us is whether these children died of COVID or with COVID. We're not privy to that information, but that's all we've had. Total in the state of Wisconsin, all deaths in children from zero to 17, we have 986 in the whole state from all deaths, zero to 17. That's 0.3% COVID deaths of all deaths in the state of Wisconsin. We need to start pay atten paying attention to what's going on here, okay? Because I don't want that child to be dipping out of here like the psych over there, because that's what we're creating, a bunch of psych people that need help psychologically, okay? That's what we're doing. 
and nobody's addressing that. I have to go up and I have to clean last year's mess with my stepson. You guys aren't paying for that. My household has to pay for that. That's all I have to say. Motion to address the board this evening. I'm just here to say that I came here to start a meeting. And not, a, not a single pledge. I'm not going to tell you my address. We don't know your name. You're out of order. For so I am addressing you. For the no, you're not going to be rude to everybody because that's what you do. You guys already have an agenda and plan, and you're going to do name what you want to do. But you're not going to revoke on my rights or my child's rights. And that's what I have to say. So just remember that. Remember that that's what you have to do. Is that you're going to tread on somebody's freaking rights because you guys got your own agenda anyway. You're just going to do it. You don't even care about the country you live in. Can't even say the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. What's wrong with you? Highly educated up here. Anyone else who would care to address the board this evening? Hello, my name is Ali Tashi. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. I live at 1400 Marshall Avenue in Cleveland, Wisconsin. I primarily wanted to come here today to thank you for your tireless dedication to our schools. Um, I understand that most of that, or I suspect that most of that is behind the scenes in your phone calls and your emails, your research, your community outreach, and the sleepless nights that you share with many of us in this room for various reasons. Tonight, I'm here as a parent of two children in the school district, um, and also as a former Sheboygan Area School District employee. I had the unique perspective last year, um, in the last two years, to be able to see how schools managed, how leaders helped, how students were uh, modeling for their teachers and teachers modeling for their students, um, how to get through difficult times together and to be resilient. I am concerned that um, we as a society have a huge responsibility. I do believe that public schools can unite us and that is why all of you are sitting where you are right now. As it comes to masking and the mitigation strategies, um, I personally have kept my children home for eight days this school year for a variety of reasons, whether that is having been in a positive, um, having been in close contact with their grandmother who tested positive, um, who, who had uh, significant symptoms. My Second grader had a fever of 103. Um, based on the school district's policies, I could have sent her younger sibling who was healthy into school, unknowing whether or not she had uh, COVID. Thankfully, despite the many, many symptoms, as others have said, real, you know, other sicknesses still exist. And we um, experienced the flu at my house. I want to, I'm concerned that it, it was up to me to protect the people in my children's classroom from them when I suspected they might have COVID. I had the privilege of being a working mother at home, of working from home. I had the privilege to keep her home and to keep her from spreading a potential disease. I hope that the decision tonight and the decisions that we continue to make can center equity. And I don't believe that we can achieve equity without having all kids access schools. So I echo what Maeve has said today. Let's remember that the goal is to educate students by keeping them in schools. And let's think of precautions versus punishments. I think that's about that. Um, thank you so much for your time and it's not necessarily related to masking, but I do hope that we can Please improve transparency. Masking and building positivity. Positivity rates. Is it about, so it's about positivity rates. I do have a concern that there are positive cases in schools and our teachers are not Time hearing about it and our students are not hearing about it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else here tonight that would care to address the board?
Hello, uh, my name is Lisa Gamble, 2809 North 7th Street, Sheboygan. You have three minutes. And I support wearing masks as part of the overall school district COVID mitigation plan. It's one tool in the whole plan. It's not tyranny. It's a tool to help limit the spread of COVID. And the thing that I wanna point out, and I'm hoping that you all will consider this as you're looking at this, there's a lot of high emotion involved in this. And I understand that. But um, what I think people need to remember is that this is really the way we need to look at wearing masks. My mask protects you. Your mask protects me. Order. And wearing our masks together helps keep our kids in school. Thank you. Anyone else who cares to address the board this evening? Good evening. Um, thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Jennifer Riddell. I live at 1622 Valkyrie Drive West in Sheboygan. Um, I know that you're going to mask our children. That is a decision I 100% disagree with. You are not following science when you make this decision. You are bound to those who either want to live in fear or those who want to maintain power and control. Mask mandates have not been shown to be effective at curbing the spread of COVID-19. A study came out this week that show that there's no significant difference in Florida between school districts that followed the law and allowed mass choice and those that imposed a mass mandate. Parents are exercising their right to make medical decisions for their children. Walk into any school and you will see that the majority of students are not wearing masks. Who are you to take away a parent's right to mask their child or not? Where is the 2% and 4% rate for masking coming from? I have searched and can find no research to support these numbers. The numbers are arbitrary. It seems that they're just made up. Menominee Falls is using a 10% rate. We're going to make stuff up. Why not use that percent? Why do you continue to provide cumulative case numbers? Anyone with half a brain knows that this number will always go up. Are you presenting this number to scare people? In the presentation from September 28th, the tables included that show the number of days different schools were in certain positive rate ranges from October to November 2020. What is so interesting to me is that this time for most when masking was mandatory in schools and in the community. As masks truly work, and there are no studies to actually prove this theory, why were there any cases? Shouldn't we see zero cases if masks actually work? Your own data does not support masking. So much time is being wasted on arguing about masks and pushing unnecessary mandates. Let parents make masking decisions for their family. It is their right. You need to focus on what is important, educating our children. Thank you very much. Anyone else who cares to address the board this evening? Eric Anderson, 1910 North 20. Wow, this is nice down here. Eric Anderson, 1910 North 23rd Street. Um, you have three minutes. All right, I'm going to use all three, but I might kind of break in between there. But since my brother up there got to talk about whatever he did, and he did an awesome job. Thank you. I can't see him from up here, but the gentleman up there in the wheelchairs um, spoke a lot of truth. Um, there is such a thing called Lucifer and the devil, and it's real. And if I was him, what she's already done, is convince people to wear something over their faces that's going to protect them. And it's actually harming you. And I feel really bad. And I'm going to, I'm not attacking anyone. I'm just talking. I feel very bad for you people, for you. I, I don't say it correctly, but you're living in fear. You don't need to be afraid anymore. It's okay. You're, you've made it through the worst pandemic in the history of the world, apparently, and you're still here. And Mr. Berg, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to insult you. If you want, I, I'll buy you a beer. I'll buy you a, a Bloody Mary and a beer, wherever you want. You pick the place. Um, I don't know really what to say anymore because 
Is there any veterans in this house? Is there any veterans? That constitution is not something you get to just disavow. I have a real quick question I'd like you to ask, answer it, Mr. Haverteen. Are you guys a legislative body? Can you make law? Because you said at the last meeting you can't make a mandatory vaccination that would have to go through the state legislature, correct? Okay, he said that's correct for the record. So if you would have to go to the state legislature to get teachers vaccinated or students vaccinated, that's their body. How do you have the authority? Where do you get the legislative authority to scare or coerce any child another person's child into wearing a mask. Could you answer that, Mr. Haverteen? Where, where do you get this authority? Is it written somewhere that you have authority over another person's body? You don't have the authority to make the vaccination. How do you have the authority to wear the mask? Just, I mean, you know, you don't have to, we're, we're, we're not holding in anything, but you're, I'm, I'm assuming you, 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 don't, you, you don't have that authority, right, correct? Uh, under, under, can you name the statute or, or something? I mean, there, there are a variety of statutes that we have to. Okay, but this is a place. Safety for our students. Okay, but this is a place of public accommodation. So any child can can declare disability. They can clear their civil rights. That they that that. This is a place of a public accommodation, correct? Right, it is. Okay, that's why you have to have wheelchair ramps. That's why you have to let people in with oxygen tanks. Some of those oxygen tanks, somebody could kick it over. It could catch a spark and kill somebody, but you have to let them in because that's a place of public accommodation. Is there anybody in this room that wears a mask that believes other people have the right not to? I guess that's an old. And we do have a medical, we do have a medical professional on the board. Um, she gave a great speech, told all the truth, told all the facts, and just for people that are new, they totally ignored her. So that's Ms. Versi. She's actually an EMT. So um, they don't listen to medical experts. So why would they listen to us, right? Sure. Anyone else who would care to address the board this evening? Anyone else for public comment? Last, last call for Anyone who would like to address the board this evening? Well, I'm Amanda Dewitt, 2622 South 7th Street in Sheboygan. Okay. I had no intention of coming up here and speaking, um, but considering there's a lot of, that I've heard that I agree with, and there's a lot I heard that I disagree with. However, it sounds as though y'all are going to mask our children if, if the numbers get to a certain point. Respectfully, two and four percent is bananas. Let's talk minimum 20%, maybe 30. Personally, I'd like to see 70, but I know you're not gonna go that far. Two and four percent, the teachers don't even notice that the kids are absent at two and four percent. Like that is bananas. During normal cold and flu season, I couldn't tell you the numbers, but I would have to assume that at least 20% of students are absent on any given day. And we are in cold and flu season. Again, as someone else said before, we can also get normal sick, not just COVID sick. And this is really important because we don't have soap in the bathrooms. What I, I seem to remember that was the first mitigation strategy that was recommended is to wash your hands for two minutes with soap and water. Thank you. Anyone else who would care to address the board this evening? Anyone else who cares to address the board? Last call for public comment. That public comment is closed. Uh, we'll be moving on to our next agenda item. Just as a reminder, public comment is closed. There is no longer time for the members of the audience to participate in the meeting. Interruptions are out of order, will be called as such, and multiple interruptions will be asked for you to be escorted into the auditorium uh, foyer where you can continue your conversation. Um, we now have item number six, which is cited for discussion and possible action. 
Board discussion on district metrics when facial coverings would be required at a building level when COVID cases are at a high level. Um, Santino. Yes. Discussion possible action. Item number six, information discussion possible action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. It's okay. Um, I would like to propose a motion um, to support the superintendent's uh, mitigation strategies from last meeting. I want to pass out uh, my motion. Could you say the full motion for us? Um, the motion would be to adopt the following possible, or excuse me, policy of face coverings, which is pretty much the one that the superintendent. Okay. You want me to read it verbatim? For the record, please, in the audience. Yes. Yep. All right, for the record, um, I Santino last to move to adoption, move for the adoption of the following policies for face covers 4K through sixth, sixth grade. Um, when active students, COVID 19 positivity cases reach 2% of the student population at the building, all students, staff members, and visitors will be required to wear face coverings for a minimum of 14 calendar days until the building students' positivity case rates drop below 2%. Seventh grade through 12th grade, when active students' COVID positivity cases reach 4% of the student population at a building, all students, staff members, and visitors will be required to wear facial coverings for a minimum of 14 calendar days. And until the building um, student positivity cases uh, rate drops below 4%. Exemptions. Exemptions from facial coverings and accommodations will be made when physical, medical, or developmental needs exist and are documented uh, from a medical provider or through your IEP process. So it's been moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Um, I'll start by Centino. If you, you introduce the motion, you can speak. Hey, you can speak to that, and we'll move to discussion. Thank you, Kyle. First, I'd like to thank the parents and community members in the audience. Um, your information is valuable. We are listening um, both sides. Um, you have to understand these decisions are not easy. Um, so we're trying to do in the best of our abilities to make the, the right decisions for our children in our, our district. Um, this whole process with our COVID plan, COVID-19 plan has not been very smooth on um, this school year. It is my hope that this motion provides the superintendent and the EMT with clear direction from the school board of how they can incorporate facial coverings during a spike of COVID at our schools. You would note that wording from the motion is exactly the same um, shared by the superintendent two weeks ago. One fact is clear, the school board and the administration wants to support the preferred option of in-person instructions five days a week for all of our students. This year, is no, this year, there is no hybrid option of instruction, which means that the mitigation strategy of keeping our students socially distanced from each other this year is no longer possible due to the number of students in our school buildings and our classrooms. As a result, the superintendent and the executive management team must have the mitigation strategies, excuse me, must have other mitigation strategies to employ when the spike of COVID in our school buildings rise. The plan that we reviewed and supported in July was a good plan for when there was very low COVID cases in our community and in our schools. It did not fully address if there was an outbreak of COVID in our communities and in our schools. We are all aware that since the start of the school, there have been a steady rise of positive cases among students, teachers, and staff. It is now the month of October. We are trying to make sure that our district's COVID plan has the mitigation strategies it needs to support in-person instructions five days a week when there is an outbreak of COVID-19 in our schools. Our superintendent shared with us last month, he felt that he did not have the authority to require facial coverings if there was a spike of COVID-19 in our schools. This uncertainty was not the intent of this board. The discussion two weeks ago shared that we support the plan that we wanted the administration to be in charge of keeping our schools safe during the pandemic. As a result, we asked him last month to put together clear guidelines for when a school might require the facial coverage and mitigation strategies in order to, in order to support the aim of in-person instructions five days a week in our schools. 
Two weeks ago, the superintendent shared the updated COVID plan with us. He and the EMT team used the data from our school's district in the fall of 2019 to determine how best to decide what the percentage of COVID cases for school grade levels should be in order to enact the required facial coverings mitigation strategy. They have wisely taken into account that more than half of our student body is too young for the vaccine. Students only 12 years old and older can have the vaccines with parents' permission. This is why it makes good sense to have a 2% threshold for 4K through 6th grade and 4% for 7th through 12th grade. Um, you can look at slide 22 of his PowerPoint. As you already know that the state of Wisconsin does not require the COVID-19 vaccination for, for students. And at this time, we have no idea how many of our students 12 years and older currently have the COVID vaccine and our school district is not allowed to ask parents for this information. Two weeks ago, the majority of us raised our hands to share consensus of the COVID-19 plan and the new guidelines required for facial coverings. Now is our chance to follow up with action. This motion utilizes the same language the superintendent and the EMT have recommended us regarding the mitigation strategy requiring facial coverings when there is an outbreak of COVID-19 in our schools. I do not think we should be in the business of suggesting other percentages for different grade levels. They have analyzed the data and have made a strong recommendation of how we can best support our aim of in-person instructions five days a week. We have hired professionals to run our school district, i.e. the school administration, the nursing staff, and we need to let them do their job. They're there with the operations every day. Our COVID-19 plan must have a strong mitigation strategy to support our aim to have in-person instructions five days a week. I think it's critically important that our board fully support the superintendent and the EMT's recommendation regarding the mitigation strategy in the COVID-19 plan. Thank you, Superintendent. Okay, is the seconder, would you like to add anything? Uh, yes, just to add a couple of things. I, I see, still see this as a compromise. I still see that in my view, we should be doing a more proactive than reactive approach to this. That being said, um, in the interest of moving forward and absolutely making sure that the school district has the authority and the opportunity to pivot when we need to as things with this virus may or may not develop, I suggest that we follow the plan that was put together by highly trained professionals that we pay a lot of money to research and look at and study and think about and confer with. And this is the plan they came up with, and I think it's time to support them uh, and empower them to do their jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now an open discussion. Um, you can put Rebecca. Um, I would like to know how we're gonna incorporate sixth grade into this. Since a lot of them are in the middle schools, or if you have like, like country, for example, they're on the same building, but they're just a protection and they're changing classrooms. How does sixth grade get incorporated into this? Beth, do you want to? Yeah, from a sixth grade standpoint at our neighborhood schools, the sixth grade is, is uh, for the most part self-contained within their building. For the charter schools, both SLA, uh, Wigan Leadership Academy and Lake Country Academy, as non instrumentalities uh, can go along with this recommendation, or the boards could look at other uh, metrics. Um, based on where they're at, there are about 71 um, students in 72, excuse me, in seventh grade and eighth grade at the country again. So at Urban, Horse Man, Farnsworth, the sixth graders don't mingle with the seventh and eighth graders. Coming and going, obviously, when they come and go in the day. But during the day, the classes are separate. Yeah. Anything else? No, no, no. comment? Sure. Yeah, I'm. Hopefully, I can remember all of my thoughts here. Uh, as it, and this is no knock against the administration. We asked you to come up with a plan. You gave us a plan. This kind of in our lap now to tweak it to see how we think would be most appropriate, or just approve it. Um, I, as it stands, I can't support this. Obviously, I would actually support mass optional 100% all of the time. But now that it's the fourth try at trying to mandate mass and we want to talk to compromise, 
<clears throat> because you need to have some kind of a bar. I think that this bar is much too low. And, I, and, and like I said, it's no knock against the administration. You had to draw the line somewhere, but it was rather arbitrary. And I guess I would propose that uh, a 10, you know, 10 percent that I had thrown out last time because that's what is required when uh, county health would be kicking in. That's what Menominee Falls, I talked to them, that's what they decided to base their 10% uh, rule on. And so I, in my opinion, a compromise would be once we get halfway to 10% for county health to kick in and give restrictions. So once we would hit 5% of uh, COVID positive cases that we then could institute the mask. But I would also ask that it's only for seven, seven calendar days I mean, I don't understand where 14 came up with because in all honesty, the people that are are being quarantined and out with COVID aren't in the schools. So it shouldn't be, you know, less of an issue. So I would think that seven days would suffice. And obviously, and I mean, as far as the compromise too, is that it would be seven days from the point where we're at the 5% or higher. That it's not just all of a sudden, you know, if day three, we're still at 5%. We still have to do seven days continuous as opposed to all of a sudden the end date comes and it just disappears. I mean, I can appreciate that if we hit that mark, it's got to be for seven days till we get that benchmark cleared. And I, that's not how I understood it the first time, but I think that that would make much more sense. Uh, the 5% I would propose across all grade levels. Uh, I think that it's, uh, I, I just, I, it just doesn't seem right and appropriate and fair to mask sixth graders in a school where the seventh and eighth graders aren't masked. That, that doesn't make any sense to me. And as far as the grade schoolers go, I think the consistency, 5% is 5%. In all honesty, the vaccinations shouldn't come into play in this at all because the vaccinated were being told can, can, can contract COVID just as well as an unvaccinated. So I don't see why the percentage should be different across the board. The other part being is that probably within the month, parents will have the option to vaccinate their five to 12 year olds to begin with because that's in the approval process and should take less than a month. So why are we gonna revisit these numbers in a month? So we just, why don't we just cut off at the chase and make a 5% across the board for the seven days? And um, that would seem to make the most sense to me. I, I just go, I, I didn't get a real good understanding of why it needed to be 14 days and once again, with uh, quarantining the sick people or having or passing a, a COVID test to return to school earlier than that, then the, the mask really shouldn't be an issue. Those people aren't contagious and shouldn't uh, need to wear a mask for, to protect anybody else or to uh, protect themselves from getting it because they just got done and they're, they're negative. Uh, I guess I'll yield. I know I think I have a couple more points, but I guess I'll just leave you in the box. Is there anything you would like Seth to address in, in that, or uh, or if you're yielding, that's fine. I just didn't know you had well, questions I guess on the 14 days. Specific and... level where we came up with 14 days, other than that's just the standard quarantine period. That's what I came from, Mark. That's the standard quarantine period, and as you looked at, uh, at other models, that's where the. And days. I guess that's kind of my my point being is that the people are aren't in the school; they're in quarantine. So why does the whole school have to still be subjected to that extra mitigation? Especially if we hit day seven and we're, we fell below the line, then hopefully that taking the sick people out of the school stopped the spread. But, you know, uh, I guess, uh, you know, uh, the other point of making a compromise and having this, you know, I, I think that if we would set a standard that people that want to have it as optional, we set a standard that would actually be looked at as being reasonable. But I think we're going to have a lot more buy-in and a lot more problems with uh, people and the building, less fewer problems for the building administrators to deal with. And I think it would also send a good message if we as a board can be unanimous or almost unanimous on setting that bar at an, at an area that we all feel is reasonable. I think that would send a message to both sides of compromise and that we're showing, you know, showing some unity there. Um, Mr. Moss pointed it out quite correctly as far as where we were at last year. I happened to actually look back and it was a year ago today that we got a, an email from Seth 
in regards to shutting schools down and that we were at, at that point on that day, we had over 600 students and over 90 uh, staff members out with COVID related uh, things. And I mean, in, in the, and that was with mass last year to compare to what the numbers are today. And I looked at, uh, we've got 47 and 53. So uh, I found it interesting that one phrase that we didn't hear at all tonight was follow the science because our science seems to be that uh, mass optional is working. And I would say that we should do whatever we can to keep that as an option for our parents. And uh, I think it, it bodes well to uh, the instruction too. And I don't wanna hear a response from this, but I'll tell you Santino, there was a lot of what you spoke to tonight I couldn't understand because I, I need to be watching the speaker and, and being able to visualize that together. A lot of that went right past me and I, it's too bad because I think that what you had to say was very well thought out and pertinent to this conversation. But using that as an example, that's, that's a very significant negative effect on instructing our children. And it was pointed out too, as far as the dangerousness of COVID to our children, three out of almost a thousand or at least 900 deaths in the state. It were, I mean, and it's not to dismiss that every death is tragic, but this isn't the, you know, there's a lot more dangerous things that we're doing that we maybe should be doing to protect our children other than wearing a mask. And I just, I, I think it's time to move on. And I think if we set the bar at a reasonable level at that 5% across all grade levels, and for only seven days that I think we get more buy-in and to me that seems to be a little bit more logical. And I mean, I could, I could go with that if I, if, the other board members are willing to do it, but as it stands, I can't vote in support of, I would, I would vote for keeping mass optional and, uh, and just move on from here and hopefully we just leave it at that, that we don't keep revisiting this every time that somebody doesn't like the outcome. I had Ryan then, thank you. Um, just to make sure uh, that I'm understanding you correctly, Mark, you are officially moving that we amend. No, no, he didn't. He didn't we, make okay. it. He can't move. He was just stating that we couldn't mm -hmm. support the motion as it currently can. Okay. All right. So that's. I just wanted to. So so there's no. So you're not amending. You're not requesting an amendment. The current motion on the floor is as presented by Santino. The recommendation we saw last week two, or two weeks ago on Tuesday for two percent eight four through six, four percent seven through twelve with exemptions for. Uh, physical, medical, or developmental needs uh, through either uh, medical provider or IEP process. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. A uh, couple of points in the discussion. Uh, one, as far as just picking a number from another school district, because I, I do see this as a compromise. If you were in the Milwaukee Public School District and you had a 3% rate, you would be going virtual. They go virtual at 3% in Milwaukee. I'm not suggesting you do that. But I'm saying you can pull numbers and, and from different districts. Uh, as far as dealing with the, the entire school, part of what happens is you have, and I still haven't gotten an answer that I'm comfortable with this, that I completely understand, as far as how we're quarantining and, and contact tracing. Because when you have a child, you frequently have my, my grandchildren. One's in second grade, one's in fourth grade. They go to the same school. If you quarantine that class, but I would have my, grand, my grandchildren would be tested. And let's say my grandchildren aren't positive. My, my kid in that class isn't positive. So he still has to stay home because he's in second grade and second grade's quarantined. Let's say that happens. His fourth grade brother could go back to school, correct? You know, so it, you have multiple children in a family that and across, and across schools even, You've got middle school and high school and so forth. This masking is one part of a bigger plan. I didn't just speak in favor of the masking numbers. I spoke in favor of the entire plan. And I, I think that's, we've gotten really fixated on this one dimension of a, of a much bigger plan. And I find it interesting that we seem to trust the recommendations on everything except for this. And you yourself said, well, you know, we, we keep bringing this back if we don't get the result we want. You sat in a meeting like this and you said, I support the plan that they come up with. Come up with a plan and I'll support it. 
and now you don't like the results, and so you don't want to support the plan. I don't believe. I don't. I don't believe I ever said that. Yes, you did. Okay. Well, yeah, you also believe the New York Times and nine hundred thousand kids were in the hospital with COVID too. No, I never said that. Did I, you overemphasized it. I never yeah. said that, Mark. Please do not distort what I said. And you know I never said that. And as far as, you know, I mean, people bring up all kinds of very interesting things that, that seem to fit with, they're looking at the world in a certain way. We need to move forward. And I do appreciate the fact that you have a suggestion and I'm listening to it. I don't happen to agree with it, primarily because I feel a tremendous responsibility to the children who are not able to be vaccinated. Their, children, their parents do not have a choice for them to be vaccinated. I don't know for certain when that's going to happen. If that were to happen and you wanted to entertain something after the, that changes and there's time in there so that you have to get it approved, then you have to give people a chance for a dose, then you have to give people a chance for the second dose, then you have to have two weeks beyond that for it to be effective. You're not talking about in 30 days, those kids are gonna be protected. There's a period of time that those of us as adults who have gone through this vaccination process know how long it takes before they tell you that you're actually vaccinated. And it's certainly more than a month. And, I, and when people compare this year to last year and say, oh, look at how bad the numbers were and look at how good the numbers are now, I'm thrilled the numbers are better because so many of adults in this community have gotten vaccinated. And, and children who are of an age that currently can be vaccinated are a certain percentage, and we get that given to us every time, vaccinated. And that's why our numbers are lower. It had an impact, a positive impact that I'm grateful for. But you're not comparing apples and apples if you don't put in the impact that vaccination has had on our having better numbers. And right now, our youngest kids don't have that opportunity. And I feel a responsibility to them and their families to do what we can do to protect them until they have the option to go through the entire cycle and actually be protected. I have, I have Sue. Thank you, Kyle. Um, the concern I have is the wording in this motion for various reasons, but not only the percentage, but um, something that Rebecca had brought up with the fourth through sixth grade. If we're looking at population at a building, my concern is you have 2% at urban. But it wouldn't be 2% at urban because it would be sixth grade is at urban. And the motion says student population at a building, four through six. So the sixth grade is at Urban with the seventh and eighth graders, correct? So that should actually be 4%. I mean, if we were going with this percent, which again, I have concerns about that. But I think the wording in this motion, I cannot agree with because it's a conflict. You have children in a different building. And if you would go by that percentage, that, that, would, that would not be affected in this. The other thing I have my concern about is, again, as the gentleman said, 2%, two children out of 100 in a building. Now, I know currently at Lake Country, I know parents there, and they're virtual. Their fourth grade is virtual. They're two, one, one fourth grade, I think, right? It's both of them. And that's 14%. That's seven children out of 50. And they're still trying to work this out as far as when do they come back? How long should we be out? Should we have them tested? Should I come back? You know, there's a lot of gray area here. And there's some children, they have no symptoms. They haven't been exposed to those seven children. They wanna be in school. Now we have those testing facilities as, as, as a parent, I would say, you know, the, the teacher is actually at school. The teacher is teaching virtual from school. So 
should we not have some variable in that to say if my stu my child is fine, hasn't been exposed, could I not come back and be with that teacher? So again, I appreciate the administration putting something together. We asked them to do that. I think there's a lot of variables in this yet. Um, the, the direct conflict I have right now is the fourth grade, the fourth through six, because six is not in the building and should have a different percentage if we can go by that type of criteria. So with that, I yield. Santino. So just to give you the numbers for um, the sixth grade of 186 students at Irvine in sixth grade, 2% would be at four people, four students. Um, seventh and eighth grade combined is 415 students. And that 4% um, COVID rate would be 17 students. So for 415 students would be 17. Um, and 486 for sixth grade would be four. That, how does that affect in the building? Because they can be exposed to other students like Seth said, coming in, going out. According to your verbiage in this, is at the building. So either we change the percentage or we change the way we include grades. Just another procedural question. Um, say uh, Santino's and, and Kay's motion would fail. Um, would we then be in order to, uh, to, to have a proposal that would be, that would be similar to what Mr. Mansell had, um, what, what, what Mark had proposed? Or would we be out of order? No, that would still be in order because the, the item on the agenda hadn't, hadn't closed okay. yet. And okay. if impossible, you could even move back in the agenda if you wanted to. We're cited for action on this topic. So if one motion fails, it would not prevent another board. Okay. I, did, I just wanted to make sure that's no, why I, I was I wondering if Mark wanted to amend yeah. what, what was going on here. So, yeah. Um, so I've got Mark, then Kay, and then Rebecca. Is that okay? Kay, Mark, Rebecca. I, I just like to ask. I just like to ask Seth if he has a suggestion of wording because this motion came from the plan that was put together by Seth and the team. So, is there any suggestion that you could discuss with Sue to make her feel more comfortable on this? The, the reason we had the word building in there was because we wanted it to be a to look at the specifics at those buildings. So, when we were looking at the sixth grade, would be to look at the sixth grade within that building. In the number of cases within the sixth grade and look at the seventh and eighth grade and the number of cases at the seventh and eighth grade. So it, the idea was building approach, i.e. urban, uh, and not looking at all of middle school or all of sixth grade. So that's when you looked at those two numbers, it really would look at, as Santino alluded to, the number of kids in sixth grade, how many cases are currently active at sixth grade? What is that percent? Did it hit that 2%? If so, that would implement that requirement for that 14 days that we put in the proposal, but it would not impact the seventh or eighth graders until we got to, or hopefully not, but we would get to that, that percent there at 4%. So it still was building based. It just separated the two, those split grade levels of six and seven. Does that make sense to you, Sue? The follow-up on that is also the vaccine. If, um, as you were talking about, Kay, with the vaccine, the sixth graders, 12, right? Are they not 12? Sixth graders turn, uh, possibly. Sixth graders turn 12 during the sixth grade year. Yes. And that is where potentially that population probably should be grouped with the older children because they could potentially be vaccinated if parents didn't want to do that. Because I understand what you're trying to do is the, the smaller age grouping as compared to the older. But I know this is this is getting into, again, breaking these down many, many levels, I understand. But I just think as a parent, if I have one child that's in fifth grade and I have one in sixth at different schools, but yet the, I think it becomes confusing. And that's, that's my other concern. So I think 
Hey, that was originally you were still asking a question. Was that well, I, I'm 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 really hoping we can address the concerns and come to some kind of consensus tonight. I think everybody would be really well served by that. Um, so I'm still trying to get. So you're thinking that parents have. You're saying if a parent has a kid at one school in fifth grade and another school, I mean, I, that's getting pretty down in the weeds, I think, as far as how many people fall into that situation. I'm not so sure how many there are. If we can, you know, the perfect versus the good, I, I don't know. You know, if we can ever address every instance that could happen, I don't know how often that occurs. Maybe it's more than I realize. Anything else there? Anything else right now? Okay. Or do you yield the floor? I yield the floor. Okay. Uh, I had Mark next and uh, then Rebecca and then David. Just, uh, uh, just to reiterate the, uh, you know, the 2% and being raising the bar, <clears throat> I think an argument can actually be made with based on the numbers in the community with COVID and the numbers in our schools with COVID, they seem to be a disparity. And it certainly isn't that the schools are getting COVID to the community, that our kids are getting COVID and bringing it to school. And obviously we're here to try to mitigate that. But again, that 2%, you could have two kids from one family that one's in third grade and one's in fourth grade, 2% and boom, we hit that mark just because the two kids from the same family and this had nothing to do with school. As far as putting masks on these kids, you know, because maybe they got COVID and maybe they didn't even come to school at all and exposed anybody, but now we're masking the rest of the school based on two kids from the same family because they hit the mark of, of the 2%. So that's why I think we need to raise the bar to a reasonable level. And I don't know if for, um, I don't want to make this real complicated, especially for our. Uh, He's going to need several tunnel after this. But <laughs> I would think that what. Ryan was alluding to later, actually, if uh, Santino would just amend it on his own, and we don't have to have a friendly amendment, or else I would say that we would take Actually, a just, just a point a note. Once the motion has been made, it is owned by the body, and he would have to withdraw the motion entirely and make a new one. The author cannot amend it without the consent of the body. So we would have to vote on any changes at this point, unless it was withdrawn from the floor and reintroduced. Do you have a suggestion if I make a friendly amendment, or if we, which is an easier process? I mean, you could, you can, you can put forward an amendment. If it's a friendly amendment, it still follows the same process as a regular amendment because the the motion is owned by the body at this point. So everyone would have to consent to I'm the not change. Sure of the motion. Master will think it's friendly. <laughs> so, so just to echo what, what Kyle was iterating here is that you would, as a board, that you would say, I'd like to put forward the, the suggestion for the for an amendment. You would vote then as a board on whether or not that you want that amendment to be, you know, change the original motion as a whole, that motion passes, then that becomes the new amendment or new motion. <clears> there would be two votes though. One, yes, two one votes. One, one would be on the first amendment. First one's voting on the amendment. Yep. And then the, the amended motion or unamended. And the second the one vote would be to vote for the other tools for dummies at home. <laughs> <laughs> the other option is to is that somebody could, that when you're done discussing, call this motion, see where it lands, and then decide if you want to do that. I mean, that's again, that's that's your work as for them. Well, I guess I would like to make a friendly amendment uh, to what I suggested before that it's five across five percent threshold across the board, and only for seven days. So, so you're moving the uh, moving to amend the motion before us. So the positivity rate is five percent, regardless of grade level, and the quarantine period is seven calendar days, not fourteen. Correct. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. We are now in a period of discussion on the amendment to the motion, which is for five percent across grade levels and seven, not fourteen calendar days. We are specifically discussing the amendment to the motion. Um, so we had a, a queue in here. So uh, after Mark was Rebecca, David, then I have Kay, then Ryan. Mark, anything further to add? Oh, you got it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, but no. I, I, I guess I would just reiterate. Uh, I, I would hope that in the spirit of compromise and putting the, the bar at what hopefully both sides would see as a reasonable spot, uh, that we would get more buy-in, and that if we show 
as a as a board here our support in either unanimously or close to unanimously that that would also maybe encourage some buy-in and, uh, and being able to uh, gain compliance if, if we were to institute a uh, mass mandate if we hit those numbers I, I think it's just we got to I, I think in order to get you know I know it's not going to be easy to get buy-in and I understand that and I appreciate that and I respect people's decisions but I think if we put it at a reasonable level that I think people could at least stomach that or tolerate that and would uh, agree to that for seven days. Okay. Rebecca? Yeah, I agree with you. I would keep mass optional if it was my choice because I think the numbers where we're going, I think they look good. I don't think there's a reason to be throwing any low mandates out there. Um, I, 5%, I think it's a good compromise. Um, one thing I wanted to ask is I called my daughter into school at North and had about a three minute long message that I had to listen to. And basically, if you have any symptom that's considered a COVID symptom, you have to get a COVID test. So I'm inquiring about that because I don't think there's a lot of symptoms that aren't COVID symptoms. So every time my child calls out sick or his stomach cramps, which would be considered abdominal pain or something, we're gonna to have to get a COVID test. Beth, do you wanna address that? Or? I can address it now, I can address it after. I don't think it fits this topic, but. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah good point, yep. Okay. Oh. Anything else, Rebecca? No, I think it's a good compromise. David? So, I, some level, I think the numbers are a bit of a moot point. And the reason why I say that is I asked Seth after the meeting two weeks ago, a week ago, I don't know, they're all blind in the dark. Um, and, and, and I respect the apples to oranges comparison of last year to this year, but the reality is I think there, some comparison is worthwhile. I asked Seth if he could, and, and Seth, correct me if I'm remembering this wrong. I said, if we had this two and 4% in place last year during October and November, when our numbers were significantly higher than they are now, how many schools would have been masking? Five. Five schools. That's correct. Um, during it was, it was, it, it was Etude High School and Middle School. Central High School. Central High School. Sheridan Elementary and Jackson. Jackson Elementary. That's it. So for as much wheeling and dealing as I think we're trying to do here, I'm bringing this up to say the numbers are significantly lower this year, I think in part because of the vaccine. I'm hoping that means the, low, the numbers are gonna to continue to be lower. We will have some kids when under 12 are able to get the vaccine, we're gonna have some kids that are gonna get it, which hopefully will continue to, I think the, the number of schools that are gonna to have to mask, pretty tiny, if, if any, quite frankly. That being said, um, I, I'm a centrist, I always have been. I, I would like to see as many people get on board with this as possible. I appreciate the movement that people are making. Um, I can I can live with, with the five. It's, I, I can live with it. I, you know, uh, and it's not me that probably has to live with it. It's kids, it's parents, right? Um, but I think it's important. I, I've just talked to a lot of people who do not come to these meetings who have said, Look at your dashboard, look at your numbers, look at look at our community, look at what's happening in our community. I look a lot at the pictures. I follow all of the schools on social media and I look at all the photos. Um, the, the North High homecoming dance um, that was in the comments. Um, there wasn't really a mask to be seen. Um, the community is moving on. And I know people don't like that. I know some people don't like that. But 
This is the community that we live in. Um, there are a lot of places that I go that used to be hardcore mask places. They are not anymore. So in the interest of compromise and trying to um, move on from this, so we're not talking about it every two weeks so we can get back to regularly scheduled programming, um, I'm gonna support the amendment. You might have Kate and Ryan. Right, or was it Ryan and Kate? Um, we'll fight over it. <laughs> Um, you know, thank, thank you, uh, thank you, Kia, for, for yielding to me, and, and, and thank you, Kyle. Um, believe it or not, if uh, Ms. Bercy had not stepped up to the plate and seconded, I would have seconded the motion. Uh, because it is, it is, this is a compromise. Um, and, you know, as, you know, as a person who is masking, um, I do that for, for multiple reasons. Mainly it's to, um, you know, mainly it's to make sure that my friend Kate doesn't get sick, you know, um, but also to, to show that you can still do work with masking on. Um, I think this is a, it's a decent number. It's not the 75% somebody threw out, I think, sarcastically <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. Um, but it is something that we can work with. Um, and will it have a whole lot of impact in our schools? I think as David said, I don't think so. You know, um, when you look at when you look at how things are, you know, we'll look at how things have been. Um, I don't think we would have this. We would, you know, I don't think masking will be will be much of an issue. Um, but we do need to put this to bed. Um, when I had made my proposal a few weeks ago, you know, I the the, the goal that I had was to have a turn on and a turn off point. This satisfies that, and I think it's it's at a it's at a goal that if, if things do get bad and, and, you know, knock on wood, they don't, you know, we have a, we have at least a, a break where we can do something. Um, and before I pass, Mr. Anderson, I will take that beer up on you, just not tonight. <laughs> and I yield. Um, just, just a little backtracking, you know, the only, am I correct, Seth, that the only school we have that has a hundred or fewer students is Cleveland? That's correct. Okay, so when we're doing two out of a hundred. That's correct. When we're doing two out of a hundred, just realize that that's only looking at a hundred. I'm so sorry, Kate. So Kate, okay, could you repeat that So question? if you're at Wilson, no. okay, what's, the, what's sorry, the population of Wilson? Sorry, we could not hear the question. Okay, I'm here. just saying, um, when Mark was using the two out of a hundred math, that would only apply to Cleveland because that's the only school we have that's that size. At the, at the elementary level, yes. We do have some middle school charter schools that okay. have so, fewer students than that, A2 for an example, um, high school and middle school, as well as Warner uh, School that have fewer than 100 students. Yeah, um, I, I'm looking I, at the, the, the non-charter schools. It's only two out of 100 to get to 2%. So obviously I know- Right, but you said, out, but you said Mark, two. Mark, you said if there are two children in a family and they're both sick, the school has to mask. And that's what you said. No, that's not what okay. I said. Quite that's exactly that. what you said. So if you've got 400 kids at Wilson, that would be eight children. Okay, that is what you said. So there's that part of it. There is still the, the younger children who cannot be vaccinated. Are we going to hold firm to the kids who are symptomatic have to be tested? And are, what are we doing as far as quarantining? It was stated in a meeting, because I, again, go back to the fact that I moved on the entire plan. Mm -hmm. We are quarantining differently than we did last year. Can you tell me what that difference is and how we're going to move forward with that? Please. The, uh, the quarantining is really, as we've talked about before, uh, done through the county health department. So when you're identifying those kids that are close contacts, they are quarantining. Uh, so how many children done. do we have quarantined right now? Uh, just give me a second, Kay, to get that information. 
We have 227 students that are currently in, as of yesterday okay. that were in quarantine. I, I'm just saying, looking at the numbers, the, the, the case that we have right now that's most active is Lake Country. And I believe today, it went, yesterday it was six, today it's 11. So it almost doubled in 24 hours. And those are only the kids who were actually tested. So if you have kids who were sent home and they stayed home and their parents are choosing not to test them, but just keep them home, they're not factored into that. But of the ones that are tested, it went from six to 11 in 24 hours. Well, if it gets, I guess if you have a motion to that effect, but I think we should probably just focus on the motion as it is, but if there's other motions for other mitigation well, strategies. Well, my, my point is that that has to do with the number that you're looking at and how effective that number is and how important that number is. Because it moves pretty quickly. Katie, you already have the I yield. I have Ryan, uh, and then Santino. Uh, do you mind if you Santino first. Santino, then Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. My hair started to swamp here. Um, <laughs> so I just want to make sure that the motion is amended. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The amendment to the motion. Thank yep. you. Amendment to the motion. Yep. Friendly. Yes. 5% with seven days. Or we just saying 5%. That's where I'm getting hungry. Yeah, so I'll, I'll clarify. So the, the, the motion that is currently on the table is a motion to amend the previously stated motion, which is to strike 2% and 4% and replace it with 5% and strike 14 and replace it with seven in reference to calendar dates. So that in effect, in summary, it's a long motion, 4K through 12th grade would have a COVID-19 positive cases reaching 5% of the student population at the respective buildings, would require facial coverings for a minimum of seven calendar dates and until the student population rate drops below 5%. That is the, the current item of debate that is on the floor. Any vote that would be on this would be to approve that change to it. It would not formally adopt that presentation. We would still have to vote on the original motion, which would be to put forward an additional mitigation strategy. Are there questions in the procedure here? Because if this does get, does get wonky, does that, that make sense? Yes. Can I, can I ask a question? Please. Mark, I understand picking out the five. I mean, it's, it's an arbitrary number, but it's, it's, it's in the middle. I, I understand that. Where did you get the seven? Well, I'm just basing that on the, I mean, the 14, I did, to me, it didn't make logical sense to, court, to institute mask requirements when the people that are out with the COVID aren't even in the school. So if, if after seven days we drop below the 5%, that's telling me that it's not, you know, the spike, we've passed through the spike that we're back down below the bar. But I mean, obviously on day seven, if it's still at 5% or above, we'll continue to mask. So did we, thank you. Um, did we, we've moved numbers a little bit over time from 14 to 10 or something, but I've never heard seven and it's seven, Calendar days, which is school days. Just, so I'm just wondering. I just I pulled it out because it seemed you, you to make sense it. because the people that are sick aren't in school because, you know, they've had, they, uh, for whatever the reason that they're out, they have to have the positive or the negative test in order to come back. To me, if, if after seven days, arbitrarily, just like it could have been 10%, you know, I went halfway to the 10% for the public health. That's where I came up with the five. The seven days is half of a quarantine period. And if, we're, if, if everybody that's been going to school with masks during that period, and we're not spiking them, and when we've gotten back below the five, it would seem that seven is not sufficient enough to bring it back down and we can be done with it. There's still people that might not be out that, you know, are still out for the up to 14 days in quarantine that they can't come back anyway because they, they're not allowed back until they get the negative test or whatever reason is that they could safely come back and I guess that but to me no, it just seems seven's a little more reasonable than you know all these people get sick and now they're out and all the healthy people are still in the school but they still have to have masks for two weeks but there's no real reason why you pick seven versus ten you just pick there's no real reason why you pick seven versus ten you just like seven better yep okay thank you um 
I have Ryan had his hand up since you know you still have the, the floor, I believe. Do you have anything else or further at this time? No. No? Okay. So I'm gonna take Ryan, then Sue. I call the question on the amendments. Okay. So um, that is a that is a privileged motion. It requires a second. Is there a second on calling the previous question? Second. Second. So there's no discussion. Immediately we're voting and we are voting on ending debate on the amendment, which we would then move to vote on the actual amendment itself. Is there any question on the procedures? All those in favor of ending debate and moving into a vote on the amendment say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion Nay. carried. Nay. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Ruling the chairs if the motion passes. So we are now back into discussion on the amended motion, which states that 4K through 12th grade would be 5% of the student population at a building, would require facial coverings for a minimum of seven calendar days, and until the student positive case rate drops below 5%. Um, so you had the floor before the, the, the motion had been called. That, and that's why I was calling a point of order and calling for the question. Okay. So with that, I yield. So we are still in discussion on the amended motion, which again is 5% 4K to 12th grade, seven calendar days or until below, and until below 5%. I'll, I'll make it easy, I'll just say, and I'm not hearing any further discussion, so I will call the vote. All those in favor of the motion? Yeah, we have a roll call. Roll call vote. Um, so we'll start at this end. Aye. Nay. Aye. 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 Nay. Motion passes. We move on to um, item number seven. Um, and David, I think we're still within the range that we discussed about continuing this one tonight. Correct. So we had, we, had, we discussed that this was interesting that you go go long. Um, the next session is to adjourn this closed session for Wisconsin State Statute for the district's annual performance evaluation of superintendent. Um, out of fairness to Seth and functioning of the board, if we were going extremely late, we were considering postponing this item. However, I think we're still in a fairly decent hour mm -hmm. given recent timing. And if the board is, I would like to continue with that if the board is okay with that. Anybody object? Sorry. Otherwise, it's going to get kicked to two weeks, and I can tell you that agenda is probably that's, that's a fairly significant. Agenda. There's a lot going on with that agenda that doesn't have anything to do with math. Okay. So, I, I, I'm board members can meet. Knock this out tonight. So we still feel we've got the energy to take care of this. This it's round not going to be. It's not going to be three hours. It's going to take half okay. hour, forty-five minutes. Okay. So I'm seeking a motion to adjourn the closed session for Wisconsin State Statute Section 19.85 sub 1 sub C to discuss the annual performance evaluation of the superintendent in accordance with policy 1240. I so move. Second. Moved and seconded. This is a roll call vote. We'll start on the end. Aye. 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 We are adjourned uh, to closed session. Um, I mean, technically, as long as they're in the room. Um, uh, Bizen moved. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? We, we are adjourned. <laughs>